who was the lead on this on this first paper, um, sent out a press release um, that garnered actually a lot of online. Uh, oh, oh. Okay. There we go. A lot of. Um, uh, I mean, it showed up in literally dozens of online science news websites and blogs and. And to put this into perspective for people in Ohio so they could appreciate how big this thing was, you compared it to the size of an Ohio county. Um, that's bigger than three Ohio counties um, put together. Um, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, that was the measure, the size of this. It was picked up in all these different news um, sites. And, and it, it actually generated some pretty funny comments. Someone said, oh, now I totally understand how big it was. It's like two million cows combined. <laughs> and what I really love, someone said, um, there's the pointer. Um, I mean, it's meaningless. It's not converted to universal standard units of Rhode Island. <laughs> someone replied, well, everything's bigger than Rhode Island. Someone else replied, my slide's bigger than your slide. On and on it went. There were quite a few entertaining comments. But this thing is big. If we were to superimpose the outline of the gravity slide in white on the state of uh, Rhode Island, you see they're comparable in size. Uh, and to bring this home for us, um, if we were to overlay that, the outline of that slide on the central Wasatch Front, you'd see it would stretch basically from the latitude of Provo north almost to Ogden take up all of Salt Lake uh, Valley, the entire Ochre Range, and a good chunk of the central Wasatch. This thing is just inconceivably big. So what I want to do in this talk is really four things. <clears throat> I want to briefly define what this slide is. I want to tell you a bit about how it was actually discovered. Because it is so big, we can't see it like we can a modern landslide in a modern landscape. And I'll present some of the evidence we have that demonstrates to us that it resulted from a single catastrophic event. And then we can briefly kind of speculate on possible causes. So if you think of the, the market gun gravity slide simply as a very, very large landslide, like that shown in green on this simplified block diagram. And like a modern slide, it consists of distinct parts. It's got what we call a breakaway zone. It's got this bedding plane slip surface. It's got the ramp where it ramped up onto a former land surface. And it has what we call flanking faults that bound the margins of the landslide. Like a modern landslide, it exhibits different styles and degrees of deformation depending where you are on this thing. If you're in the breakaway zone, we, you see principally extensional type of deformation. Above this bedding plane slip surface, this is an area of principally just translational movement, where we've got individual blocks that are hundreds of meters thick, tens of square kilometers in extent, that exhibit remarkably little internal deformation until you get down to that basal slip surface show you some of the things you see there. And at the ramp, as you can imagine, we see extreme compressional deformation. And we see compression and resultant thrust bulking and folding over the former land surface. And importantly here, for the most part, we see old, older volcanic rocks sitting on younger volcanic rocks. <laughs> Finally, at the leading distal edge of the landslide, we find that the deeply eroded remains of what we interpret to be debris avalanche deposits, where this slide is just completely broken up into chaotic blocks. So where are we talking about this? Whoops. <clears throat> This is the Marysville Volcanic Field, this area in pink, and we're talking about the southwestern sector of that. And the Marysville Volcanic Field, um, in its heyday back in the Oligocene to early Miocene, 
from about 30 to 20 million years ago, um, consisted of these clustered or nested stratovolcanoes and, and a few calderas. So what we have in essence um, are, in this area, are relatively mechanically competent lava flows and relatively incompetent volcanic mud flow deposits, lahars, the, the vent and the alluvial faces on these stratovolcanoes. And they're interbedded with ignimbrites, these asphalt tufts that erupted both from the Marysville field itself and from the Indian Peak and Caliente calderas on the present-day Utah-Nevada border. And it's those ignimbrites that serve as important markers that let us understand the extent and the style, the deformation. So now, I guess you can kind of see where this is going. Outlined in red is the extent of the gravity slide as we understood it about a year ago when we wrote this paper for geology. And the, the, the slide, um, all these rocks in pink are these variably deformed Oligocene and Miocene uh, volcanic rocks uh, that moved, and I'll show you how we know this, that moved from the north to the south. Well, can you give us a couple yes. of cities out there? Yeah, sure. Um, Cedar City here um, and Beaver here, this is the Interstate 15 corridor and, and basically the the present day boundary between the, the basin and range and the high plateaus of southern Utah. Now, now remember about 20 MA at the kind of the peak volcanism in this Marysville field, Utah looked a lot different. This was pre-basin range extension. Um, the Marysville field lied really at the eastern end of a high elevation plateau that people call the Great Basin Altiplano. The landscape here was very, very different. And all of these different volcanic rocks, all the dozens of different formations, those names are really not that important for us here today, but one of the names is. And that's what lies at the base of this volcanic field, at least the southern half of it. And that's the Brian Head Formation. It's as much as 300 meters thick fine-grained volcanic plastic rocks, clay-rich rocks, that to this day, wherever they're exposed, they tend to form small landslides. Um, now, with another year's field work this last summer, um, we actually discovered that the eastern flanking fault and we worked to better define the northern extent of this thing and the western extent. Pete Rowley is, is really working these areas quite hard right now. <clears throat> and with still more field work, um, this thing keeps growing. We now know it's over 4,000 square kilometers in size. Um, originally, we had estimated this was about, in red, in, in this geology paper, about 3,400 square kilometers in size. Coincidentally, that is about the size of the Hart Mountain Gravity Slide in northwestern Wyoming, which has long been known as the world's largest subaerial landslide. Um, so with our additional field work, you know, this thing is over 4,000 square kilometers. We think it's the biggest one in the world. And I was giving this talk a couple months ago, and someone said, that they didn't realize that geologists suffered from size and the, <laughs> the way that paleontologists seem to. You know, when every new dinosaur discovery is the biggest and the baddest, you know, my favorite T-Rex has is, been is dethroned by this Spinosaurus creature, for example. Um, I mean, it's a size that gets our attention, but it's really the individual um, structural details that we see with this slide that are really important and intriguing. I'll show you um, in just a minute. But anyhow, this thing we now know stretches um, roughly 100 kilometers north to south and some 65 kilometers east to west. Um, 
we estimated the volume of, of something over 2,000 cubic kilometers in the material involved in this. And what I find really interesting is that this is the ramp fault in purple here. We can show that this slide moved from 35 kilometers over this former early Miocene land surface. And I think we have really good evidence to show that it did so very, very quickly. And based on analogy with this Heart Mountain slide that people have worked on and tried to figure out speeds of replacement, I mean, we're talking possibly speeds of 100 meters per second. You know, that's two to three times as fast as you can drive from Beaver to Cedar City on Interstate 15 with this 80 mile an hour speed limit. It's pretty wild. <laughs> Now, before I um, talk about what kind of evidence we could possibly have to support a story like that, I want to take a minute and just say how this thing was discovered. In the first parts of what we now understand to be the market gun gravity slide were actually discovered by a student in the early 1970s by the name of James Judy. He was working under John Anderson at Kent State University. His job was to provide the first reasonably detailed geologic map of the volcanic rocks on the plateau up above Cedar City. It's beautiful country, but looks pretty darn simple and not that exciting to me. Um, anyhow, we're looking, we're, we're on Bryant Head Peak here, looking northeast to Sydney Peaks and this black ledge. What Judy found is this is the, all this tree-covered slope is underlain by the Bryan Head Formation. It forms this big modern-day landslide complex um, where the town of Bryan Head is, is located. And above that, Black Ledge itself is composed of two of these very distinctive regional ignimbrites. The 27 mil million year old Isom Formation capped by the 24 million year old Leech Canyon formation. Okay. And at the top of the black ledge, guess what he found? He found a few meters of brine head strata. And on top of that, then a different asphalt tuff with 30 million year old Wawa Springs. And on top of the Wawa Springs, then he found the ice. So what Judy found here at Sydney Peaks, this is the discovery area, are these older volcanic rocks sitting above younger volcanic rocks separated by this sub-horizontal surface of some sort? Weird. They had no clue what was going on. <laughs> a couple years later, John sat on another student, mapped to the northeast of this, and found similar sorts of things. And kind of fast forward here to, um, it wasn't until the, the late, 1980s to early 1990s that John and his students finally had enough mapping together where they could begin to understand what was unusual about this relatively simple looking market of plateau. And what was unusual, of course, is the presence of these gigantic blocks like this that are out of place. And in 1993, John formally defined that unit as the Markagant Megabrush. And he attributed it to landsliding or gravity sliding of multiple ages and causes, but wasn't certain what direction things were moving. Oops. Now, concurrently, the USGS was mapping in areas to the north and to the west of where John and his students were working. And Florian Maldonado here discovered and mapped what he called his Red Hill Shear Zone. And this is where he interpreted that the volcanic rocks were everywhere tectonically detached from the underlying sedimentary rocks. And again, he didn't have a, a good idea at the time of why that might be, but he thought, well, maybe this is due to um, low angle detachment faulting or something associated with early extension. <clears throat> and what I find funny about all of this, this, this is a uh, slide 
kind of outlines the extent of the, the gravity slide as we understand it today. In dark green is that part of the slide north of the ramp fault, and in light green the remnants that are preserved south of the ramp fault. And this is the area kind of hatchered here of John's original market gun mega brush. Florian's Red Hill shear zone was in the northern Red Hills in this area. And what I what we now understand is that these are really two parts of a much, much larger feature. And I and I gotta show you this slide. Because it just reminds me of this allegory for the blind men and an elephant. And in the beginning, just imagine this thing was so big, it can only work a small part of it at a time. It said it was just too big for any one person or any group of people to understand. And I, I, you know, I mean no disrespect by that, but just at the time, there wasn't enough good mapping available to know what they were dealing with. And this is kind of where I come into the picture here. <clears throat> I was assigned the task of, of, of mapping this Penguin 30 by 60 quad that stretches basically from Cedar City over to Bryce Canyon uh, National Park. Um, and in doing that, that actually allowed us to see some of the really instructive exposures of this gravity slide for the first time. And there's, I guess, three events that I can point to that kind of collectively yielded our eureka moment, if you will, where we realized that the Market gun mega pressure is then defined and restricted for this area. And the Red Hill shear zone over in here for parts of, much, of something much bigger. And the first occurred actually when I first started mapping here. Um, this is Penguich Lake. And just east of Penguich Lake is Haycock Mountain that I'll show you in just a minute. Some really exceptional exposures at, the, at Haycock Mountain. And then a few years later, um, here's Penguich. Um, just northwest of Penguich, we discovered um, friction-generated melt at the base of the gravity slide, pseudo -tacular. And then um, we also discovered then evidence for, for widespread shearing at the base of the slide, wherever we see the base exposed. And those were kind of three key pieces of this puzzle that, that um, what I think of the elephant's trunk, as it were, that let us, um, I think, put this thing together. <clears throat> now, before, um, I mean, I, I wish there was a single place I could take you to to see this whole story, but it's too big. I mean, we can't do that. It, it takes really a couple of days out in the field to, to get an appreciation for what we did is for last year's UGA volume is we wrote um, basically a field guide to this gravity slide. And with that, we identified um, the 17 or so really instructive exposures where you can go and to see different aspects of this gravity slide. And I'm going to show you um, just a few of those today, beginning here at Haycock Mountain, which is east of Cambridge Lake. And I want to jump north of the ramp fault and show you this uh, pseudo tackling discovery site. And then we'll look at uh, a few other things in this well. And this is, all right, Haycock Mountain. We're looking um, southeast here towards uh, Bryce Canyon National Park is, is over in the distance on the far side of the Ponsagon Plateau. And Haycock Mountain here is capped by um, the 27 million year old Tyson Formation. It's a really dense and welded igneous right? I mean, it's every bit as hard as a basaltic lava flow. Very, very dense and hard thing. And it overlies um, these light gray, white, fine grain volcanic plastic strata, or the Brian Head. In this area, that's a normal stratigraphic section. If you look at this from a distance, you wouldn't think anything is unusual. Um, but I was working this area, and I stumbled across this exposure at the base of the, the cliff. And 
there weren't this many people there when I did not <laughs> No one had seen this before. And what is really astounding is that this clip of ISOM formation has been pulverized into sand-sized pieces and then solidified. And hand sample, this is kind of a reminder for me to let you know that I've got some samples up here in front if you want to look at this stuff after the talk, but um, a before and after version of it. And in thin section, um, here's a scale bar of a half a millimeter. Um, you get these fragments of isom ignimbrite that are floating in this matrix of pulverized isom. So it's, it's a cataclysite. And what's more, that cataclysite grades upward at the top of the cliff. The, the isom looks pretty much under. So unless you see the base of it, you don't really know what's going on. And, and what's more is that the base of the isom, look at that contact, that really sharp planar surface. Um, it sits above about a foot thick basal pressure. And that pressure consists of, of a broken up isom and brine head debris that this slide wrote on. And that was over pressure. When that slide came to a rest, it was forcibly injected as dikes into the upper plate, as, as into these uh, plastic dikes. Um, it, is, it is these plastic dikes and that basal brescia that are really strong, as I understand it, really strong evidence for catastrophic emplacement um, versus emplacement, say, by uh, low angle detachment faulty. So they're uh, really important uh, discoveries. And we see this sort of thing now at multiple lo locations across the, the extent of the gravity slide. This is uh, David Hacker and Pete Rowley, again, about a mile to the west, still on Haycock Mountain, um, looking at pulverized isom formation, that a um, little closer view of that, and you see how shattered and broken up it is. But what is really neat at this exposure is that the base of the slide is really well exposed. And so you see these grooves and striations and these fractures um, that we call Riedel shears that demonstrate that this thing moved from the north to the south. And again, this is something that we see now at multiple locations across the gravity slide. And here, actually, um, the slide rests not on brine head formation, but it rests on gravels that have been eroded down into the brine head. And they contain rounded boulders of the isom formation and rounded boulders of a 22 million year old natural tub. So here we've got this beautiful boulder on the moon. <clears throat> this is part of a geologic map we just published of the Haycock Mountain Quadrangle. There's a part of Cambridge Lake um, right here to give you a sense of where this is. And this is Haycock Mountains, six or so mile long panel of this kind of light pinky purple unit. This is all the isom formation. And what's kind of cool about Haycock Mountain and that I certainly didn't appreciate, you know, five years ago back when I first saw this, is that State Route 143, which winds along Cambridge Creek there, is actually the type section of the Market Gun Language that John Anderson defined in 1993. You can drive that and look at the road cuts and see how deformed these volcanic rocks are. And they sit on what looks like undeformed ice can't see the base of the ice, you can see the top of it. But what these exposures show is that this whole town of ice is part of that upper plate. And these really squirrely deformed rocks here are also part of that uh, upper plate. So that was kind of my first clue that something here is, is really kind of weird. <clears throat> um, again, so we were looking in here at Hickok Mountain. I'm going to jump north now and look at this area just outside of Penguins and show you um, 
what I wish I had discovered, but I didn't. Um, David Hacker discovered this. This is a place you can drive by. We're north of the Ram Fault here, area of, of, of principally just simple translational movement in the slide. So we're looking at uh, volcanic mud flow deposits of the uh, Mount Dutton formation that overlie these lighter gray, um, uh, actually volcanoclastic Neolian beds of the Bear Valley formation. So again, a normal stratigraphic section here, you drive by it, you're mapping, you're trying to do eight quads in a year. And you know, I didn't walk up here and look at this, but David did. Um, and what he saw is that this is not a simple depositional contact, but it's, it's a glass line shear plane. Um, th this line with glass, it looks like obsidian. Right? And that, that glass is injected as dikes then into these lower plate rocks. If you look down on that shear plane, you'll see that it's full of uh, vesicles and flow features. Um, and it, it's present as these um, dikes that are you know, typically up to a few inches in width a few tens of, of feet um, in length. Um, they look for all the world like obsidian. Um, a little closer view. And in pin section, um, cross nickels, what do you see in a glass? I mean, it's, it's a pure, pure glass. It's amazing. It's got a few relic floating, partly melted mineral grains um, across the polars. And you see these really kind of cool flow features around these, these greens and vesicles. This is a pseudotacolite. And to our knowledge, it's the first recorded occurrence of pseudotacolite on a gravity slide in North America. And it's one of the few examples in the whole world. And it actually, there, there's several other sites that I've come across <coughs> um, where people talk about a glassy frictionite. And I, I, I wonder if that is it's really a, a true glass like this, or if it's an ultra cataclysmic that has a glassy matrix, or, or what, I don't know. But this stuff is pretty special. It's important for one thing to demonstrate that the high temperatures that were, were um, generated on this, this, these basal shear surfaces, I mean, over 1,800 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, certainly 1,000 degrees C. Um, we just got back an age on this class <laughs> that unfortunately didn't work out for us. It, it um, was a low confidence age. Glass is apparently very difficult to date to begin with. Um, but this was a low potassium glass, um, had a low radiogenic yield, and we think it was partly contaminated by some of these relic uh, grains. So the age we got back was 28 uh, MA. Uh, we wanted to see something more like 21, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But um, I've since learned it's actually better to try to date glass that has been devitrified, because that apparently occurs at high temperatures shortly after emplacement. And that might give us a better chance at getting a, a, a good age on the emplacement of this thing. So that's something that, that I think try um, once we can round up some money to do that. Um, All right, I want to show you another thing now. This eastern planking fault uh, we discovered just late last summer. It's in, in essence a left lateral strike slip fault that bounds the margin of this gravity slide. And here we're looking south along that flanking fault, and here it puts Brian Head strata against Brian Head strata. Um, and if we're off the, the, the gravity slide here, this is, it's hard to tell, but it's basically sub-horizontal um, Brian Head formation. We've got the swirly fault zone, and then vertical and intensely fractured Brian Head strata in the, in the upper plate of this gravity slide. And that's something that, that we see along the length of this flanking fault for some reason is that once you cross that fault and get into the upper plate, the beds become vertical. And 
And another example, again, looking south along the fault. Um, this is sub-horizontal um, volcanic mud flow deposits of the Mount Dutton Formation. And, and right up against it are these vertical um, lava flows of the Mount, Mount Dutton Formation. <coughs> and these more um, mechanically competent units like lava flows um, tend to get just absolutely crushed and pulverized and sheared, and almost beyond recognition. So this is, um, was pretty exciting to actually find the margin of this, this gravity slide. We're still looking for the western margin. We know it's west of Utah 130. Um, but basically due south of Milford. I mean, we know it, it goes quite a ways west into the Black Mountains. So, so we're looking for something like this to the west, but we haven't found it yet. Another kind of interesting thing that we see in the, in, the, in the slide are that class like this. I mean, if I was shown this, this is a quartzite cobble. I'd say someone put that in a, in a vice and crushed it. it it's, this exhibits profound crushing and shearing, yet it's re-healed. It's, it's every bit as resistant as the original class. Um, and we find these things um, in the upper plate, near that basal shear or near smaller displacement internal shears. And they come in all sizes. There's a thin section of just a, a plagiary place, phenocris, that exhibits this you know, beautiful boxwork-like fracture pattern. See it in, in large boulders, like this andesitic boulder, you know, cut by these um, fractures, but then it's re-healed. And another view of, of this guy, um, what, what's really important about these is, is what they tell us about stuff like this. This is Sandy Peak. Everything you see in this picture is up a plate, if you believe our story. This is sub-horizontal, not dutton and mud flow brushes. And, and the way that we can tell that these things have moved um, versus being just a primary lahar that has not moved is the presence of class like this. Because you don't find these in primary volcanic mud flow deposits. If they crack, they tend to get split apart and totally separated. So these things are actually turning out to be fairly important in helping us to define what's upper plate and what's lower plate when we're looking at just really boring the hard deposits. Um, all right, so that's just a few examples of the, the, the type of deformation that we see. And it's a uniformity of, of these slip vectors that we can measure that is shown on these black arrows. We've got them scattered over a few places now. It's kind of uniformity of those things that we see in the overall geometry of this whole thing that leads us to conclude it, it represents a single catastrophic replacement event. And it's not, you know, multiple slides derived from multiple sources of multiple ages. Right. Now, we get a sense for how big this is, but when did it happen? Well, it was originally thought to be unconformably overlain by this ash flow top, the Haycock Mountain top, the local top of the Marysville Volcanic Field. And at the time, back in the early 90s, this was dated at, at about 23 million years old. Well, when I was mapping, I found the gravity slide actually sitting on rocks as young as the 22 million year old Harmony Hills top. So here's an example of the more you know, the less you know. You've got a 22 million year old top, you've got the gravity slide, you've got an apparently undeformed 23 million year old top on top of it. So these dates aren't really working. I mean, originally tried to explain it by saying that you know, this guy was just simply one of these large drafted blocks that went along to the right, didn't experience any deformation. There's reasons we don't really think that was the case, but at any rate, I redated this, got a uranium lead age on zircon of about 21.6 MA. So our best guess now 
is that this Hickok Mountain Top is actually a post-gravity slide astral top that's preserved in stream channels, eroded in, into the top of the slide. So we think this thing was in place between 21 and 22 MA in blue minus. And obviously, we've got a lot of work on dating to do to, to try to uh, verify that. Um, All right, getting to the end here. Um, we think we know how big this is. It's at least 4,000 um, square kilometers. We think we know about when it happened, but what the heck happened? Um, you know, I think what happened is actually fairly straightforward. But I, I, I don't claim to understand the mechanics yeah. involved at all. Um, remember, the Marysville volcanic field you know, this huge pile of volcanic rocks and stratovolcanoes and calderas. And the southern margin of this thing, at least, is built on a very weak substrate for the Brian Head Gorge. And so we think this is a relatively simple case of just gravitational collapse of this volcanic field. And that was actually first understood back in 1993 when Pete Rowley and George Davis um, put together a model, what they called their two-tiered model of gravitational collapse of that volcanic field. They had a deeper seated part of this and a superficial part. And the deeper seated part is none other than the Pontagon Thrust Fault System exposed at the north end of Bryce Canyon National Park. And that is a south virgin thrust fault that puts upper Cretaceous rocks on Claren Falls. Um, here's a simple cross-section to kind of show that from the north to the south. Uh, these thrust faults sold into middle Jurassic evaporite deposits of the Carmel and Caribbean formations um, at a depth of uh, two kilometers or so. So there's that deeper seated part of this gravitational spreading of the volcanic field. And there's a superficial part um, related to the collapse of part of this field to generate what was then understood to be the market mega pressure. And, and we, I guess, expand on this idea just a little bit. In this two panel before and after um, cross section from north to south through the southern part of the volcanic field. And notice that it's built on this red layer. This is that clay-rich volcanic plastic beds of the Brian Head Formation. So we think this is you know, a relatively um, let's see how to phrase this. I mean this collapse is due to a combination of this volcanic field being built on you know, a fairly weak foundation, possibly in combination with inflation and tilting of the volcanic field due to the emplacement of these shallow lacolithic intrusions um, along actually um, old severe age thrust faults. And that idea is kind of attractive, attractive to us right now because we know in southwestern Utah there's you know, half a dozen or more smaller lacoliths that have come up into the shallow crust and inflated the overlying beds and in shed gravity slides, you know, west of Cedar City and the Pine Valley Mountains. Classic examples of that. So maybe something similar uh, to that is going on here, but at a much, much larger scale. Um, just to wrap up here, um, again, we now know, um, based on our most current mapping, that this is the largest slide known in the world, um, over 4,000 square kilometers in extent. Show that it moves some 35 kilometers over the former early Miocene land surface, and we think at a very high rate of speed. And it's that the basal brush and the plastic dikes and the friction generated melt um, that we think is pretty strong evidence of, of catastrophic emplacement. Um, we can show, um, you know, from the from the kinematic indicators that it came from the north to the south, and this is all consistent along the extent of the slide that we've seen so far. We 
big then that happened is a single event about 21 to 22 MA, and related to the gravitational collapse of this volcanic field. And that gravitational collapse, I mean, it's something that actually is ongoing today in many modern large volcanic fields, Mount Etna, um, Canary Islands, Big Island of Hawaii. All these things are, the mass of all that volcanic material is depressing the crust and, and oozing out, basically, to form these flanking crust called systems. And unfortunately, we don't have a modern analog to the catastrophic part of this uh, yet. That we want. Anything. Um, I think I'll, I'll just stop there, and if, if you've got questions, I'd be happy to try to answer. And, and again, we've got some samples up here of kind of before and after of what these rocks look like. Yeah, great. Um, along the same lines, um, I think it's all built on the uh, rise formation, um, which you show fairly uniform, but then when you have this attachment coming up onto the ramp and out, Quite a thickness change. Is the dying head carried in the attachment, or why do you have that thinning? Um, good question. Let's see. The, the Brian head is basically smeared out um, where we see it at, at the base of the slide. Um, and in, I get the sense that it acted um, effectively to reduce the basal shear stress on that surface. And this is really a cartoon. It's um, we probably need to draw something a little better and to scale now that we have more mapping available. But yeah, the thought is that it failed in the Brian head, and it would have failed um, basically at the at the toe area of this former volcanic field. I mean, think about you know this huge volcanic pile and tapering to the south. At some point, that wedge was just no longer an adequate buttress for this ever-growing pile of volcanic rock, and it failed, and then we go to the south. But again, this is something that, you know, I'm just a map writer. We need some guys that that know about rock mechanics and modeling and all this stuff to get involved, too. Uh, um, at least 6,000 meters. Um, 6,000 meters? Yeah, going up, up in the source area. That's everything that's tumbled around here. Right, 6,000. Um, let me think. And I think I, we work in feet here at the survey, and I always get confused. Maybe um, it's at least a couple thousand meters. Thing. I was thinking. The Pine Valley lactolith is uh, 20 to 21 MA. All these lactoliths, incidentally, are about that age. Um, uh, early Miocene, they came up into the shallow crust, typically into the um, Claren, often, or into the Carmel, and you know, a few hundred meters below the surface, actually, and spread out as these sills that inflated and bowed up the crust and, and shed off these slides. You know, we don't know whether or not that's going on here in the southern tushers. I mean, it's still something that we're, I mean, it needs a lot of work. Good question. Um, why why did this happen just on the south end of the Marysville volcanic field? Um, you know, I think it's it's got to be related to this brine head formation. We don't know that it happened anywhere else on the Marysville field, although I know at the base of the volcanic pile, um, you know, south of Richfield, there's some pretty incompetent mud stumps there as well. But again, you know, this thing is so big, you can look at, at mountain ranges that are, you know, 20 miles long, and you think, God, how could that have moved? But then you get a window into the, in through the, the shear, you know, it has to. It's just, it's, it's pretty mind-boggling. Yes? Um, why does it still work? So, when you put the new and large shape, and you take it further to the north, it's almost taken it up to the crust zone, there outside the area. So, how does okay. the crust zone relate to the, the 
This is right. a really good question, and I didn't really address this. This is the Mineral Mountains. Right here. That's something we're going to look at this summer. I, my guess, we don't really know. We know um, we have this well defined here. Um, where it goes up in here, we're not actually positively certain yet. I think this structural high of the Deer Trail Mine is is going to be part of that story. Um, but that's something we want to look at this summer. That, this is a really weird structural high, right? It's sitting thousands of feet above where it should be. And the same is sort of true over here, the southern end of the Mineral Mountains. Um, you know, this is the largest exposed intrusion in Utah. And, and, and we think somehow this is probably, this actually may be involved as well. I mean, it's got some really weird things going on. And people have worked on the past on this and said, oh, you know, this is one of these, um, basically a core complex. These are low angle detachment faults and that sort of thing. And there's some key things we can look for um, to distinguish something, a structure that is, is rooted due to this low angle early extension versus something that's later due to a single event catastrophic emplacement. So I think that's actually, you know, this is going to open up over the next couple of years, and it'll be interesting to see what we find. As you move all that mass, remove it all from the source area, and then transfer it to the where it ended up. What, what kind of uh, collateral or other things would you expect? Remove all that mass somewhere. I, I, I think the early horses and the camels that were on the flanks of this volcanic field had a, <laughs> had a really bad morning. You know, in the early I think, I don't know, I mean, all sorts of collateral things that you can think about, drainage, reorganization. Um, we think now, and I didn't really talk about this, but the Mount Belknap caldera is up in here. We think that is partly overprinting and may have destroyed the breakaway zone. And again, that's something Pete is working on. Um, yeah, I mean, kind of the far field effects of this, what might have happened? It's, I don't know, it, it's intriguing to think about. Again, if, if you want to take a look at samples, it's getting late, I know. Um, but, but you're welcome to look at kind of before and after what happens to these rocks and see some of the glass if you want to do that. So. Yeah, thank you. And any other questions? Yeah, I forgot to ask him what he was your gift. So he'll get some things for you to get Yeah, what do you want, Bob? <laughs> I'll go grab one.